Hello, Gary Stearman. Today's guest on Prophecy Watchers is a global traveler, but he's also a deep thinker. And that deep thinker and global traveler is Tim Alberino. And Timothy, it's good to see you again. Very nice to be with you again. Tim uh, has done things that a lot of us would like to do, but, it, but when it came to actually doing it, we would probably say, no, I'm going to let him, I'll let Tim do it, like uh, rowing down the backwaters of the Amazon <laughs> and catching malaria. And uh, no thanks, that's not for me. But on the other hand, you've done some exciting things that have uh, given you a way of approaching Bible truth uh, in a totally unique manner. And it kind of background yourself so that people who are not familiar with Tim Alberino can get a little uh, taste of what you do. Well, I uh, grew up in a, in a very good Christian home. And so the Bible, the, the biblical narrative, and, and frankly, a personal relationship with the Lord has always been the foundation of my life, always, ever since I was young. And that sort of led me on a journey when I got older, uh, when I was 18, 19 years old, I was very hungry to, ex to encounter God and uh, to understand, comprehend things um, that I was striving to comprehend, uh, biblical truths and, and so forth. And so that sort of led me into the Amazon. And that's a long story. I won't get into why I ended up going to the Amazon. But that's, a, that's a book. That is a book. <laughs> and so when I was long, very long yeah. story short, I found myself living literally in the Amazon, the deep jungle, when I was uh, 19 years old, 19, 20 years old, and began, this is going to sound strange, but it's true. You know, I dropped out of high school. Uh, to move to the Amazon, and it's when I got to the Amazon that my intellectual pursuit began, hmm. uh, which sounds strange. You know, I drop out of high school, move to the jungle, and that's when the, the <clears throat> this intellectual pursuit of the, of the biblical narrative and of the gospel, and really beginning to understand for the first time what the story of the gospel was, began in the Amazon. By the way, this book is worth reading because it connects ideas for, for Christians. If you're interested in, in, in going to, uh, shall we say, the next level in spiritual exploration and uh, the level that involves understanding God's motive, the ages past, the things that he's doing right now in this world. And by the way, I've got a question. <laughs> What's the elder race? Well, the reason why I decided to invent this designation, elder race, for this class of beings we, we're familiar with as the angels, that's the familiar reference that we right. have um, in Christianity and, and, and from the biblical narrative. The reason why I, I created this designation is because the term angel, as you know, is ambiguous. It is. It's a very ambiguous term, but yet these beings are very important, and they're prominent in the scripture. So you have an ambiguous term that's used to describe this, this very intriguing race of entities that are out there. And so, uh, the, and I believe that the word uh, angel, uh, malak in the Hebrew, angelos in the Greek, is is intentionally ambiguous, hmm. uh, and well, and and as you know, the the word angel and malak, both in the Hebrew and and the Greek uh, uh, form of the word, is used to describe not just the heavenly beings. It's also used to describe because the word means messenger. Let's say yes. that the word means it, it, um, it's an envoy, one who is sent a messenger. It's used to describe human beings also who are functioning in the capacity of an envoy or a messenger, both in the, in the Hebrew and in the Greek. So the term is very ambiguous. And it does not, it's not a designation of kind. So it doesn't describe the kind of being. It's a designation of occupation. It's an occupational designation. So when we encounter the angels in the Bible, they're being described as angels. They're, they're being described as messengers, as envoys. And that's how we find them in the scriptures. And so that really got me thinking, okay, this is what they do. 
They're right. angels <laughs> in, in the sense that they convey messages. They're envoys from the kingdom of heaven, from the king himself. But what are they? Who are they? What is their yeah. nature? Where do they come from? And this really got me thinking, well, they must have a history, just like we do. We right. did, we did, we, the, human, the human species, we have this long storied history now, the history of civilization, of human civilization, and so forth. Well, doesn't that also then apply to these beings we call angels? And so I wanted to give them a designation that was more uh, descriptive. And so when I thought about it, two characteristics were, were immediately apparent. Uh, first, that they're older than us. Yes. I think that's clear. I think that's evident in the, in the biblical narrative. They are older than we are, okay? So that makes them elder. So they're certainly older than us, according to the biblical narrative. And then more, secondly, they... More experienced. Exi more, much more experienced, much more knowledgeable than yeah. we are. And then the second thing is, is they must constitute a race. I mean, if they're not a race, what else are they? So we're talking about a, 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 an older race, an elder race, a race of beings that pre-exists mankind and whose civilization pre-exists our civilization. In fact, we, I believe, have inherited our civilization from them. Hmm. And by the way, ours is a finite civilization. Human civilization has a definite starting point. We get it in the Bible. There's no doubt about it. But those messengers... <laughs> Really, where'd they come from? How long have they been around? Where were they before humanity existed? What were they doing? And so that gets us started on a great uh, search for, for something interesting. Those are very powerful questions you just asked. Questions that a lot of people don't contemplate. How many people actually contemplate, is there a history here? Is there a history here with these, with these, with these angels from, from the biblical narrative? And, and, and do they have a civilization? Are we talking about, do they have technology? Yeah. Do they have a society? And I, and I believe that the biblical narrative, the answer is unequivocally yes to all of those. And by the way, their, 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 their civilization, where do they come from in terms of, of their civilization? The kingdom of heaven is yeah. the answer in the scriptures. That's the answer that the scriptures gives us. They come from the kingdom of heaven. And so when they come to the human race, as in the capacity of an envoy, they are, they are coming with a message. They're, they're dispatched, carrying a message from hmm. the kingdom of heaven to mankind, and specifically from the king. You know, you have just really opened up a, a large pool of uh, questions here. And, and, and the questions uh, bring to my mind odd facts like, yeah, there's a heaven. Everybody talks about heaven. Even people who do not believe in God or Jesus particularly uh, talk about heaven. Oh, it was heavenly. It was, you know, oh, it was just like heaven there. I went to the Bahamas. It was like heaven. Well, how do you know? You've never been to heaven. Well, but people talk about heaven. And, but where's the door? How do you get into heaven? Uh, I, nobody I know has ever been there. So this book, and the reason I'm going through this exercise is because this book kind of takes you through the door. <laughs> yeah, heaven, you know, this place, <laughs> heaven, it has, it's, a, it's a locality. It has an, it has an address somewhere. It isn't yeah. just this abstract, ethereal thing. It's, 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 uh, it's an actual place. Right. And so... Uh, the question then becomes, and by the way, we, when we talk about heaven, we're also talking about the Father's house. This yes. is how it's described in the scriptures. Jesus describes this, as the, in my Father's house are many mansions. Right. So it, this is a place that has locality. And it, it, in the book, I, I, I postulate a new theory that, well, new for me, new for me. Perhaps, okay. it's, perhaps it's floating out there somewhere. But I postulate in the book, and I may or may not be right, it's just, it's kind of an, it's just kind of an, an intellectual exercise that I do in the book. What if the Garden of Eden in paradise wasn't actually on earth? What if it was the gate to paradise that was on earth? Hmm. And so I believe that Adam had access to the Father's house in the beginning, and I, and I believe, and again, I could be wrong, but, but as an intellectual exercise, I go through this in the book, what if paradise is heaven and that the gate to paradise was on earth, the gate to paradise was on earth. And it functions as what's called, what's known as an axis mundi, that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entranceway into uh, another realm uh, rather than that realm, rather than that, uh, that place actually being on the earth. Instead, the gate is here. And, and furthermore, and this is kind of giving away the punchline to that thought, furthermore, 
I postulate that that gate was actually located on the summit of Mount Hermon. Hmm. And, and, and precisely the place where we find the watchers coming to the earth through the gate on Mount Hermon. So I think that, that Adam had access to that gate in the beginning until he was shut out. Now, hold that thought. And while you were talking, I was thinking about the, our magazine, The, the uh, Prophecy Watcher. And uh, from time to time, we have guest uh, authors like, uh, like Timothy and, and many others. And the, the subjects upon which they write are, are just very close to what we're talking about today. We, uh, we like to go a little deeper th than uh, others might. And uh, here's how you can get your uh, uh, subscription to The Prophecy Watcher. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Ulrich, Gary Stearman's partner and the co-founder of Prophecy Watchers. I would love to tell you how you can become a subscriber to our wonderful prophecy magazine, creatively named The Prophecy Watcher. And ready for this? how you can get eight powerful prophecy DVDs as a free bonus for subscribing today. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Keep a close eye for a series of wars coming very soon to the Middle East. The Bible's a supernatural book, and we enjoy covering the fringe subjects and dark corners of Scripture as well. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today. For your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value, but it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. We're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that he's coming back very soon, just as he promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world. Well, I hope you'll take advantage of that. And uh, while we were gone, I was thinking of, a, of another question. Because I'm thinking of the gate uh, at the Garden of Eden that was guarded uh, by a couple of cherubim, which means that if it had to be guarded by cherubim, it, maybe it took you into a, a different dimension when you went through the gate. I can't imagine that, that, that the cherubim are guarding entry to the paradise of God against Adam and Eve and his offspring. It, it, it seems to me that the cherubim and the flaming sword and so forth are actually prohibiting entry of somebody else and something else, perhaps, perhaps the devil and his angels from gaining uh -huh. access to paradise. That would seem more appropriate because I doubt that Adam and Eve and their offspring could even see the gate anymore or have, we certainly can't, we don't have access to it anymore. So. Uh, there's something very interesting going on there. I think is more there than we originally think. There really, really is. You know, we read uh, about <clears throat> those goings on. For example, in the first chapter, uh, chapter one, first chapter of Job, there's a meeting uh, but between uh, Satan and a, a group of angels and God. And it's obviously a seminar. You know, sit down. We're going to have this long discussion. We're going to ask questions. And 
the whole book basically is a series of questions about what did God do and why did he do it and why did Satan essentially object to what he was doing and it was it's kind of a seminar mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I should say that Job was the seminar and and someday I'm going to meet that man and and ask him a couple questions but but until then and your book, when I read your book, it puts me in that frame of mind. Mm -hmm. it, it takes me to places that I really want to go the next step. And that's what I like about it. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, it's, and, and, and really, while I was writing this book, I was forced to, instead of just kind of superficially glossing over certain topics, I was forced to, to dig deeper into them because I'm a very practic practical person. And my mind is very, it's, it, it, it's I, like, I like sequence, I like things in sequential order, and I like to think as logically and rationally as I can about things. And when you begin to unpack some of the, the things that we're talking about, um, so many Christians, I believe, have a, have, they, they have a belief in the, in the scriptures, they have a belief in the biblical narrative, and, and obviously a belief in Christ, but there's almost like there's a curtain between between this physical reality that, that, that we are experiencing right now and the reality of the biblical narrative, narrative as it pertains to angels and, and so forth, and this other realm that, that we find uh, interacting with, uh, with our realm continually throughout the biblical narrative. Right. It's almost like there's this curtain there, and everything on the other side of that curtain is just fuzzy and abstract and intangible. When I think that's, that in reality, that's not the case. I believe that on the other side of that curtain, things are much more tangible than, than, than we can imagine, and real, and physical, and, and so forth. And, and it just, when you begin to unpack things, like you begin to think about the angels as a civilization, yeah. it, 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 becomes, uh, it, 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 it becomes palpable now, because now you're talking about things that we're familiar with. You're talking about you're talking about language and knowledge and history, technology, um, the kinds of things that we think of as human, when in reality, those concepts predate us. Even, they do. even, even the concept of government, uh, uh, the, the, con the concept of society itself, and, and, all the, and all the things that go with society, like uh, armies and and governance and judicial system, the that's black, all predated us. The black market, that's what came to my mind, believe me, because you, you mentioned Mount Hermon and the, the fallen ones who came down through that perhaps gate at Mount Hermon, and they came selling uh, <laughs> accoutrement. That's, that's right. The weapons of war. That's right. And whatever else you wanted to buy. So they were kind of black marketeers. <laughs> you know, and that's really interesting. I, I really thought about uh, the Watchers and that whole scenario. And some things occurred to me, some interesting things that I detail in the book. But, you know, the Watchers, they, what they did was not haphazard. They had a plan. And this was a very well thought out plan because they knew that when they were going right. to descend to the earth that they were committing a grave transgression. That's why they bound each other by an oath. Look, if right. one of us is going to get in trouble for this, we're all going down together. That's it. Because they knew the gravity of what they were doing. And what they were doing was, as I said, extremely calculated. And when they came down to the earth, they didn't just descend into the plains um, around Mount Hermon and begin to, you know, take women at will and, and rape them. No, what they did was they married them. They married these women. They took them as wives. And, and, there's, and, and so what I see happening here, and again, what I detail in the book, is that there was a transaction that, that took place. Because the Book of Enoch, which your viewers are probably fam very familiar with, in the Book of Enoch, it talks about that the Watchers taught mankind the secrets that they were striving to learn. So the watchers knew, and you talk about the black market, the, this exchange of knowledge, they already knew what mankind was trying to learn, and so they came down with a bargain. We're going to give you the knowledge that, you, that you're striving to learn, and what do we want in return? We, we want your daughter's hands in marriage. In marriage, in return. And so there was an exchange, technology for, uh, for the daughters, uh, and I believe, specifically I believe, and this is my postulation, the daughters of Cain, and, and I talk about why I believe it was the daughters of Cain, you know, the line of Cain, not specifically the daughters of Cain, but the line of Cain, the women in the line of Cain. So the watchers made a transaction. Here's the knowledge. You give us your daughter's hands in marriage, legally. Give us your daughter's wow. hands in marriage. 
And, and what came of this transaction was, of course, uh, they wrought great destruction in the earth and the giants and so forth. But, but there was a transaction that occurred, and it has to do with the human birthright. What you're doing is making real that which is uh, kind of a fuzzy, um, ill-defined history. Uh, the universe as seen from our side of the curtain. And you put things together, and as you get toward the end of the book, uh, things get very much clearer. And you make a couple of uh, postulates there. So go, let's, let's go a little farther. Okay. Uh, you know, in the beginning of the book, I lay out... So the, the, the first half of the book is kind of laying the theological foundation for what I'm headed towards. So I go all the way from Adam... Actually, I, I start in a pre-Adamic context, move through the creation of Adam, all the way through the watchers and the flood of Noah, because I'm making my way to... Um, one of the most important uh, topics that we could possibly discuss, which is what's coming, what's imminent on the horizon, which is a post-human paradigm. So we're moving towards this, this reality on planet Earth where human beings, are regular old organic human beings, are going to be pretty scarce um, in the future, according to the projection that I see going forward, the trajectory that we're on. We are headed for a post-human paradigm very clearly. And so um, this has to do, in my mind, th this has to do very much with the coming, the return of Christ, the Battle of Armageddon, and where all of this is ultimately headed, uh, hmm. that, that final confrontation where Christ comes and vanquishes the, the, the beast and the empire and destroys the empire of the beast. So that is, uh, uh, that's, you know, the final chapter in the book is called Jacob and Esau. And so... Uh, I start all the way in the pre-Adamic context and move all the way forward to the Battle of Armageddon, the return of Christ, and I try and connect all these dots, including the Watchers and everything, to demonstrate that what's about to happen on Earth is that mankind is about to sell his birthright for a bowl of stew. And this is, this is a cunning ploy by our adversary who is seeking to usurp our birthright and make war with the Son of God, who is returning to reclaim it. I'm looking at Isaiah 14, <clears throat> where Isaiah uh, documents Satan's fall. And Isaiah 14, 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. And that ascending above the heights of the clouds, you know, and you, where is that? <laughs> it's another dimension, I believe. And I wanted to uh, continue our discussion on the basis of uh, how we should perceive what God is doing for humanity. Obviously, from a Christian perspective, we should view everything that's happening and everything that has happened in, in the course of human history through the lens of the gospel of Christ, because that's the point. The gospel of Christ is the reason. It's, it's, it's the story that's unfolding that we're all a part of. Yes. And, and it really begins... The, the, the beginning of the gospel narrative begins in the very beginning of Genesis, and, and it follows all the way through to the end of Revelation. And it's that story, it's the, most, it's the greatest story ever told. In fact, I, I'm, I contend that every story that has ever been told, every romantic story, every, every mythic, heroic story is fundamentally based on the gospel of Christ. Hmm. Because Christ is the, is the archetype of a hero. And, and, and he saves us. He saves mankind. He delivers us. And he restores us. And this is, you know, the foundation of my book is the fact that and so many Christians understand that Christ redeems us. They understand that we're redeemed in the cross and by the blood yeah. of Christ. And we're redeemed, and, and, and we're, we're redeemed from condemnation with the dragon, by the way, not just some abstract condemnation. We're condemned with the enemies of God. And, and we begin that everybody begins in a state of enmity with God. And that's our problem, right? We're estranged from the family. Right. And he reconciles us back to the Father. And the, and the word reconciliation means to be brought back into friendship or to be brought back into the family, to be reconciled to the Father. So he redeems us and he reconciles us to the Father so that we might be restored to what was lost in Adam. And you know that word reconcile um, also has the meaning to change. We have been changed. Yes. And that change that's taken place in us is not visible in us yet, uh, except by maybe by our works. 
But the actual change that's taken place, that reconciliation, is huge. It's, it is huge, and it's an internal change. It's a working of the Holy Spirit inside of us. But ultimately, it's also going to be an external change. Yeah. That's called the resurrection. Right. And we're going, to be, we're going to be, and the resurrection is a restoration of mankind back to the blueprint of what we were supposed to be in the beginning. And all of the defects that we have in, in, our, in our genes, in our, in, our, in our genomes, are going to be rectified. And we're going to be restored in Christ. Uh, and, and, and restored to what Adam was supposed to be in the beginning. Yeah. And that's the most exciting thing that you could possibly imagine because what that means is reconciliation with the Father. We're going to be back in the family. It's the, it's the parable of the prodigal son. The book, Timothy Alberino, is called Birthright. You know, as you're talking, uh, my eyes strayed down here to cover this book, Birthright, while you were talking about reconciliation. Those two ideas are two ideas really that are one idea. And that's, that's exactly right. That's exact. They are one idea because um, our birthright from the beginning, man was created. Man wasn't created and then given a purpose. Mankind was created for a purpose. And 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 I see the purpose of mankind is twofold. Number one, it was fellowship with the Father. That was the. Yes. F- that's our primary purpose, is fellowship with the Father, and that's what Adam had in the garden. Remember the Father. The the, the Lord walked in the in the cool of the day. He had fellowship with the Maker. And then the second purpose is a functional purpose. We were created to have authority, to have dominion of the earth, to govern the earth. Right. So we were created with, uh, for, to have fellowship with the Father as a son in the family, and then to govern the earth. That was our function, was to govern the earth. And so that's, and, and everything's, it's, it's all going full circle back to the beginning. The, this trajectory of, of history, the biblical narrative, takes us all the way back uh, to all of that being restored to us as it was intended from the beginning. And so, the, and so what is the birthright of mankind? The birthright of mankind is dominion of the earth. It's the mandate. It's the, it's the deed of the earth that was given to Adam and his yes. offspring to govern the earth. And, 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 and I take you, through, in this book, I take you through this, and I show you how, at the end of the age, from my perspective, at the end of the age, we lose the birthright. But... There's a, even though, and, and this is a phrase I use in the book, because I talk about how at the end of the age, we're, call, we're going into a post-human paradigm where there's scarcely going to be a human being left on the planet because of the transhumanism that's taking place, leading us into a post-human paradigm. And I make a case for that in the book. But even if there are no more human beings left on the earth to, to inherit the, dimin- the, the birthright of Adam, mm-hmm. there is still a son of man seated at the right hand of the Father. Wow. And he's going to return, take, he's going to return, he's going to break the seals on the deed of the earth, come back and restore and, and win back what was lost for mankind. That's why I say he's the ultimate hero. Jesus is the hero of humanity. He's the greatest hero mankind has ever known. Greatest hero of the universe. Of the universe. And, and, and he is perfect, which my mind can't even deal with something perfect. I've, I've never uh, held in my hands something perfect, for example. Because we live in a world, a kind of a broken world, if you will, where everything is just a little bit not quite, you know, could be better. Uh, but we're going to be, uh, if you will, reconciled, to use your word, into a perfect place. And we will be as he is, the Bible yeah. says. Yeah. We will be as he is. And so Jesus resur- rising from the dead was the first fruits of those who would follow in the resurrection. So that is, the, I mean, I, again, I can't think of anything. There is literally no tale, no story, no mythology more exciting than the gospel of Christ. I, I have to totally agree with you. And in your book, uh, the things that you've done, uh, you've sort of brought the supernatural uh, into a forward position. In other words, the supernatural is not something to be ducked and, <laughs> and covered, and we'll talk about that later because it gets too complicated. It's not supposed to be that way. I think the Bible wants us to talk about the supernatural, and you've gone the extra step in, in birthright, and uh, you are to be congratulated, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, the supernatural is... is uh... When, when we talk about these things, we're, we're talking about something that is entirely natural to us and for us. And I believe that Adam, in the beginning, 
could perceive what I call the, 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 the dimensional totality of created order. And that's something that we've lost. And remember that, uh, I, I believe it's Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's Paul who says that in, in, after the resurrection, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see him as he is and be yes. seen by him. We're going to know him in a way in referring to Christ. So in other words, I talk about in the book that our, we have a problem right now. We have perceptual cataracts. <laughs> and that's what Paul says that we see yeah. through a glass dimly. That is precisely what cataracts is. It's a film over your eyes that inhibits you from, from seeing the, the totality of, of, of what's around you. So we as a fallen species, we have, we have perceptual cataracts. But, but at the resurrection, those cataracts are going to be removed. And we're going to be able, I believe, to, to, to perceive the dimensional totality, the splendor, the full spectrum of the splendor of creation uh, as Adam was able to see and enjoy it before the fall. And the fascinating thing is that uh, God allowed a rebel, and, and he was a superior form of life, the dragon. It, God allowed that rebel to do what he would. And, and I'm positive that God could have stopped him at any point. That theme really underlines so much of what's happening in the Bible, the fact that this rebellion happened. And, 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 and I believe it happened, I know there's some dispute around this, but I believe it happened before Adam was created, before Adam showed up on the scene. So Adam shows up in this context, in the context, in, 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 the, in the aftermath yes. of, of, of rebellion, war, and ruin. And so there's this whole faction that exists by the time Adam is, uh, appears on the stage, there's this whole faction that exists that is at war with God. And so Adam is, is being tempted and tested in the Garden of Eden. Whose side are you going to be on? Because remember, he's going to govern the earth. Right. He was created for fellowship in the family, fellowship with the Father, and to govern the earth. And so it was kind of a test. Whose side are you going to be on? Are you going to be loyal to the king, or are you going to, are you going to throw your lot in with, with his adversaries, with his enemies? And, and this is really the, the struggle of mankind throughout the scriptures. Is, is the, the dragon is always, the devil is always tempting man to defy God. And, and God is always bringing, bringing us back to him yeah. and ultimately redeems us and reconciles us and restores us. The thing that, uh, that amazes me is that we as, as human beings on planet Earth going about our daily life do everything we can to block out the, the truth of what's in this book, to block out the fact that there has been a rebellion. There is difficulty. There are uh, malevolent forces just behind the curtain and that we need to put on the whole armor of God. And, and we, uh, as, as a species, uh, are not prone to follow the words of God. He offers his love and his, and his salvation. And, and we always, anyway, not always, but much of the time we say, uh, uh, sounds good, but later on, if, you know, get with me again in a couple of months and I'll let you know whether I want to take advantage of your offer. <clears throat> That's our usual a uh, reaction because we don't know what's in this book. Exactly. Because <laughs> e even a lot of Christians struggle to understand the gospel, especially in you know, postmodernism and, and how that's influenced yeah. Christianity. And uh, so, so many Christians think that the gospel of Christ is that we're supposed to just love each other and, it's, and it has social implications, societal right. implications, that Christ... What he does is he fixes the world and, and he makes society better. That's not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the rectification of the human condition. It goes all the way back to Adam. It restores us to the Father. And so, and that's why, you know, Jesus didn't come and to fix the world. That's not what he did when he came. He came to redeem, he, to, to, to seek and save the lost and to redeem us so that we might be reconciled to the Father because he's going to come and establish his kingdom and change all of this anyway someday in the future. I guess it's been called in the movies the greatest story ever told, but that movie just talked about Moses and the parting of the waters. The greatest story ever told is uh, cosmic. And I always think when I hear that word, I think of Carl Sagan. <laughs> You know, and he talked about how big the cosmos was. And he launched into this uh, uh, poetic description of, of the cosmos, almost as though he's suddenly standing out there in the middle of the galaxies. Uh, 
But what we're talking about is bigger than that. It's, and your book conveys that idea. It's galactic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rather, yeah, I guess you could call it that, or maybe intergalactic. Yeah, yeah and it really is. The scope, I think that um, we, 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 we just simply cannot comprehend the, the scope of the biblical narrative. And, that's, and I think that's a good way to explain it. The scope of the Bible is not just human affairs and what's happening on earth. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're talking about uh, the, the, the cosmos of creation and, and, and our place within it. Yeah. And to understand our place within it, to understand what it means to be human is so critical. It's so much more critical today than it ever has been because in the future, I believe, we're, 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 going, to be, we're going to be selling our birthright for a bowl of stew. We're going to lose our humanity in the future. And the way that's going to happen is through the technologies and through the genetic modification, the, the human enhancement uh, products that are going to be hitting the market before long. And so we are headed towards a post-human paradigm in which, in which, in which we, shed, we shed Adam and we choose to consciously evolve ourselves into, some, into something else. And so the question is, what does it mean to be a human being and what, what are the implications of becoming something other than Adam. For, and, and the implications are we forfeit our birthright. And again, the, the, the title, birthright, you just heard Tim say it, we forfeit our birthright. But, you know, I was thinking as you're talking, we live in a really amazing era at this point with, with artificial intelligence, uh, with genetic manipulation. Uh, we can literally take God's created beings and turn them into trash. Corrupt them. Corrupt them. And the Bible speaks a lot about that corruption, which began with uh, a famous incident in the Garden of Eden. But it has not stopped. Satan still has his plan. That's right. And you can see the, 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 this conspiracy, this machination of the dragon through the scriptures from, from, from Genesis to Revelation in which he is, he, is, he is always trying to corrupt humanity and, 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 and even genetically. Right. Um, and that's where this is all headed ultimately because we are headed towards a post-human paradigm. It's, it, there's no way to stop it. It is inevitable. And so it is so important at this time in history that we understand the gospel of Christ because the gospel of Christ pertains to the offspring of Adam and only to the offspring of Adam in terms of the salvific implications of uh, Christ became us to save us. He's our kinsman redeemer. And so at this point in time, when we're on the cusp of an age in which men are no longer going to be human, we really have to be able to, to preach the gospel in a way that highlights this dynamic that Christ came to save the sons and daughters of Adam. He did not come to save you know, post-humans, right. hybrids, because when, yeah, this isn't science fiction. This is coming. And when, talk a little bit, bit about that. Hybrids, uh, transhumans, what are you really talking about here? Well, there's, right now there's, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this undercurrent happening um, that m some people are, are somewhat aware of, but it's, it's flowing at such a rapid pace right now, and it's dynamic. It's, it's, it's about to change everything, and it's called the genetic revolution. And it's, and it's not just genetics, but ge genetics is one of the things that's moving is very quickly. It's, it's a suite of bi biotechnologies that are rapidly developing, that are going to converge. And when they converge, they are going to allow us to fundamentally change our biology, to become something other than human beings. And this is, the, and this is it's unprecedented. Um, there, is a, there is a biblical precedent, but the way yes. that this is happening, yeah. the, the specific way this is happening is unprecedented. And there's, you know, there's four primary streams of biotechnology that are going to converge, and there's other streams branching off of these, but the four primary ones are genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. And these are, these are sometimes referred to as the Grin technologies. And these technologies are all, are, are all um, developing at breakneck speed separately, but eventually they're going to converge. And that's why technologists and futurists call the age that we're in right now the hybrid age. And that, of course, that, that, that of course recalls to mind the, the first hybrid age in the pre-flood world with the yes. fall of the watchers and so forth. But we are literally in the hybrid age when yeah. these things come together, hybridize, and they're going to fundamentally change our 
what it means to be human. Slow down just a little bit because that might have, might have gone past some people where pre-flood, uh, there was a hybrid age. Sons of God came into the daughters of men and produced something that God never, never desired. Unsanctioned creatures that were never, never intended to exist. These were the offspring of the, of the watchers and, and, and the daughters of men. And they copulated and procreated a hybrid race of entities. And, and, and in the book, by the way, I, des I, I, I describe why I believe they did that. Because there was a plan. There was, it wasn't haphazard. It wasn't just something that, that, that uh, they weren't just driven by a desire to copulate with human women. They had a plan. And part of that plan was to usurp the birthright of Adam. And they did it before the before the flood, and I explain how that happens and, and why that happened, and they're going to do it again before the end of the age. So we're coming full circle. We are coming full circle. We, the, in, we're going to see things that the earth has not seen since before the flood of Noah. Wow. The book is called Birthright by Timothy Alberino, and uh, uh, I'll whisper this to you. <clears throat> the last chapter really is amazing. But don't read it before the rest of, it, <laughs> of the chapter. Just go, go right through the book. Uh, you'll be amazed. But that last chapter, wow. <laughs> Here's how you can get Tim's book. I think it's safe to say that Timothy Alberino has spent more time than most exploring God's plan for the future of humanity. Tim's book will be a breath of fresh air for those of us who want to understand the mysterious things that have occurred in the ancient past. His unique insights focus on an ages-old battle between Jesus and the fallen cherub Lucifer, who once led a heavenly rebellion that fractured heaven and earth and led to the creation of man. Lucifer's desire to destroy humanity, men and women made in the image of God, is hard for us to fathom. But throughout history, he's tried to destroy everything God called good. Tim's research on the genetic hybrids of Genesis 6 led directly to the catastrophic flood of Noah and the near destruction of the entire human race. His hatred of mankind continues to this day through transhumanism, artificial intelligence, and the destruction of man's DNA. Tim's new book, Birthright, The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse, is available through our ministry for your gift of $30 or more, with shipping and handling included anywhere in the USA. We'll also include a free bonus DVD as our way of thanking you for your faithful support of Prophecy Watchers. We want to continue to bring you fascinating guests and open the pages of the Bible in new and exciting ways. Simply call the toll-free number you see on your screen to get Tim's book and support our ministry. Tim played a big part in the True Legends DVD series, a worldwide adventure tour that's jam-packed with trips to places most of us could never hope to visit in our lifetime. These four DVDs, Technology of the Fallen, Unholy Sea, Holocaust of the Giants, and Forbidden History will take you on a whirlwind tour through the mysterious world of biblical archaeology. In this series, Tim searches for the remnants of the Nephilim all over the world, explores the great Nephilim museum cover-up, and exposes the hidden secrets of the Grand Canyon and the Vatican. When you choose the True Legends DVD series for your gift of $120 or more, we're going to send you Tim's new book, Birthright, as a free bonus. Shipping, as always, is included in the USA. You can find this offer and many others in our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv. I suspect that when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised at some of the things that we missed. Who thinks about the weapons Satan and his angels might use to fight against God Almighty? Or the role the mysterious cherubim played in the Garden of Eden? Well, as you heard today, Tim Alberino does. I know you're going to enjoy his unique research into these curious subjects. Thanks for tuning in today. Be sure to tune in next week for another fascinating look into the past and the exciting eternal future Jesus has prepared for us in his Father's house. And I hope you take advantage of uh, this offer because it's worthwhile to really have an understanding of 
where all this craziness is going. You look at it right now, and we're in an era of uh, upside down backwards politics, upward, uh, upside down and backward uh, economy. Uh, uh, our foreign relations are a big question mark. We have China. Uh, we have a number of things happening. Uh, and I didn't even mention Russia. You could get really confused and really upset uh, if you forget the goal, who we are in Christ Jesus. That's right. And the prize and, the, and our hope as believers, the resurrection and restoration, reconciliation with the Father. And that's really what, what grounds us as believers, because no matter what happens, no matter what happens in this world or how things go, or we know that we know what the work of the cross has accomplished for us. Amen. And we, we run the race with endurance because, because if, we, if we die believing in him, so shall we be, we be raised in him. And we're going to be like he is, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, we will see him for the first time. Exactly. Uh, that is, the eyes we have right now, I don't think can even comprehend who he is. <clears throat> no. I, th I think of the Apostle Paul. He had eye trouble. And he, uh, I think he prayed to the Lord, you know, he's a thorn in the flesh. I think that may have been his eye problems. And he had trouble seeing and he wanted to see naturally. And the, the, the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. I'll carry you through even with eye trouble. And uh, you know what? That's humanity. Humanity uh, has a new vision, but we can still have that eye trouble a little bit. Yeah, perceptual cataracts. <laughs> but I love what you've done with the book, and uh, we've got just a little over a minute now uh, to uh, close out. And uh, as you struggled to write this, and I, and I know exactly that it is a struggle, but because it, to do something as, uh, as well put together as this book, you really have to work. Yeah. And, and just a, a word or two to the audience about uh, what's in the book. Well, the book is very complex. As I said, it, it, it takes us all the way from a pre-Adamic paradigm all the way forward to the Battle of Armageddon. And it weaves together a bunch of very complex topics. I talk about, uh, I talk about the Watchers. I talk about the creation of mankind, the purpose of mankind, the Garden of Eden. I talk about the Watchers. I talk about UFOs and aliens. And I work my way all the way through the post-human paradigm and transhumanism and all of that, all the way to the return of Christ. So I cover a lot of ground in this book. I've been listening, you know, and, and just kind of imagining where you went to pick this up and how you connected all these ideas together. I, I did read the book. And uh, the last chapter, you, you sort of go elsewhere in that last chapter I into uh, another world. And let, let's go there for a moment. Where... where where was your mind when you were putting that together? Well, you know, the, the, the thread that, that you can follow from beginning to end in this book right. is the gospel of Christ. Right. That's, that's really the, the main primary and most important theme that is being traced through the ages, through, through this book from beginning to end, from pre-Adam to Armageddon. And so the final chapter is, is about the return of Christ and the dynamics that are happening on the earth when he returns, from my perspective, and I believe from the, from the biblical perspective. And it's really a, it's really a dystopian nightmare that, 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 uh, that we're going to be experiencing on earth uh, directly uh, preceding the return of Christ. And so the last chapter just describes um, what's going to happen when humanity arrives at this post-human paradigm, which is which is what I call a new golden age. It's the resurrection of, the, of what I designate as the empire of the gods from the old world. In other words, it's a time in which uh, there's, there's great corruption in the earth, just like in the days of Noah, as Christ referenced when, 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 when talking about the, the, the end of the age. So um, that's the, the final chapter. That's really the crescendo of the whole thing. It's, and and, and it's, it's really good news because... because because Christ is victorious and he crushes the empire of the beast. And, and thousands of people, maybe millions on horses and, and our Lord on a beautiful horse leading a, an army and these massive uh, uh, battles going on. Uh, and you, you try to get your head wrapped around all that. Yeah, and I have a different perspective because... Uh, 
than, than most people. I should say um, uh, I have a different view of, of what that battle is going to look like because, you know, I talk about, I, I believe that the, the, the armaments that are, you know, and here's a question to, 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 uh, to express what, what I was about to say. Here's a, here's a question that I always used to think when I was younger, and this is one of those things I really started to contemplate when I, when I was in the Amazon. I had a lot of time to think in the Amazon. Um, what kind of weapons do men bring in a war against God? Because this is where it's headed. We all know that this, because Armageddon isn't just a war against Israel. Armageddon is a war against God. And, and, and we know that because of Psalm 2. I yeah. believe Psalm 2 is, is, a, is, is depicting this final conflict that between man and God. And of course, man being led by the beast and, and, and the dragon and so forth against God and the powers of darkness. And Psalm 2 is, you know, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Yeah. And the kings of the earth and the rulers have, are basically conspiring against the Lord and against his anointed son, right? And so this isn't just a war against Israel. This is a war against the father and his son. And so what kind of weapons do you bring when your intention is to go to war with God? And that's a very interesting question, and I, and I, and I try to answer it in the book. And you've got to read the book. It's called Birthright, Timothy Alberino. Tim, the clock disappeared during this interview because I'm, I'm really interested in what you have to say, and you're going to have to come back and talk with us some more. Absolutely. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.